guys, and welcome to your last installment of chapter 4. So this is section 4.3, and we're going to be looking at where electrons are located in the atom, and how to write down the energy and the orbital that they are in. So, let's begin. First, we're going to begin with electron configurations. What are they? Well, they show the arrangement of electrons in an atom. So in any atom, it will show you where all of its electrons are located. When we do electron configurations, we're always going to use the ground state electron configuration. And that's because electrons are constantly moving, they're constantly getting energy and moving to different energy levels and falling back down. Uh, so we're going to use the ground state. That way we say where, if there was no energy around, this is where all of the electrons in this atom would be located. So we're just going to use the ground state so we don't have to worry about where things are bouncing around to. So when we write electron configurations, there are a couple rules. First one is the off bow principle. This says that electrons are always placed in their lowest energy levels first. Uh, so we're always going to start closest to the nucleus and then work our way out. Actually, if you think about it, it makes sense. Then we have the Pauli exclusion principle. And this says that electrons that are in the same orbital must have opposite spins. So last time we learned that each orbital could hold up to two electrons. And as they spin, they create these opposite magnetic fields. Because they have opposite fields, then they can occupy the same space. So we just have to make sure when we draw them in that the electrons have opposite spins. And we'll show that with arrows later. And finally, we have Hund's rule. In Hund's rule, we're going to fill one sublevel of an orbital with one electron each before we double up electrons. So we want to make sure that everything is filled or all the different orbitals are filled. Like in P, there's three of them. So we want to make sure we have one in each of the P's before we double up uh, in any one of its orbitals. So Hund's rule is basically like the empty bus seat rule, we like to call it. Because in the empty bus seat rule, uh, if you think about getting on to an empty bus or a bus full of strangers, nobody knows each, o each other, uh, everyone gets on, they're going to sit in their own seat because then they have room to spread out and they don't have to sit by someone they may not know. So usually people fill into a bus and they sit by themselves. Well, then that next person gets on the bus and there's no empty seats, then they have to double up. So that's kind of what the electron does. It wants its space. Uh, so it's all going to fill one first, and then we run out of room, and then we start doubling up. So we call it empty bus seat rule. So let's look at actually writing electron configurations. Now there are two different ways that we can show the electron configurations. The first one is through orbital notation. In orbital notation, we use a line to represent an orbital. The number of lines that we have depend on the number of sublevels that we are filling. Our energy level and orbital type then is written underneath the set of lines. So as you can see on bottom, we have one line because S only has one orbital. And we put the energy level there. So this would be the first energy level. We are in an S sublevel and we only have one orbital. In this case, we have three or the energy level is three. We're in an S sublevel. Again, S only has one line. So it doesn't matter what energy level it's in. We still go lines by the sublevel that it's in. In this case, we have something in the second energy level, signified by the two. We're in P, and since the P sublevel can have three different orbitals, we have three lines. And finally, we will use arrows to represent electrons. So you may not have enough to fill all of your spots, and that's fine. So for example, in our 1s, we have one electron, and it's the up arrow just means it's a certain spin. It's got one spin. In 3s, we can hold up to two arrows for each orbital. Uh, they must have opposite spins, so that's why we put one arrow pointing up and one arrow pointing down. And then we have Hund's rule shown here as we have, or we have filled one orbital at a time before we doubled it up. So we don't have two in the first line, uh, but we have one on each line first before we double up. 
So that's what an orbital notation is. It looks like a bunch of lines and arrows. Or we can use a regular electron configuration notation. This is going to eliminate lines and arrows, so we're not drawing anymore. We're just going to list the energy level, which is the number, the shape of the orbital, which is going to be S, P, D, or F, and the number of electrons in that orbital. And we're going to put this as a superscript after the shape. So what it's going to look like is a power, but it's not a power, it's just a number, number of electrons. So, for example, if we use the same ones that you just saw, we have 1s1, so instead of 1s with a line and one arrow, we just show that we have one electron. 3s2 means we had two arrows. You'll notice that when we do electron configurations, we don't show the spin of the electron, so we just have to remember that they would have opposite spins. Or 2p2. Again, by putting the two, we have to remember that they are in different orbitals. Um, they aren't doubled up right away. So again, we have to kind of know a little bit about uh, the different rules when we're looking at electron configurations. So how we know how to fill these in or how the electrons go? Well, we use this energy pyramid. You can see we have S, P, D, and F. So those will signify the different uh, sublevels that we can have. And then the numbers in front are the energy levels. So again, this is our energy level. And this is the sublevel shape. So how we use this energy pyramid? Well, we use it like a staircase. So we're going to go up the staircase. And when we hit the corner, then we're going to go diagonal down till we hit the bottom. So once we hit this bottom, this is kind of like our stopping point. Can't go any lower, so then we have to go on. So then we move, and we hit 2s. So we go to our next corner, and we go down diagonally till we hit the bottom. So if we were writing this out in energy, we would have 1s, then 2s. And moving on up, next corner, go all the way down till we hit. So this would be a 2P. And then as we continue on, we have 3S. Go to the next corner, we do 3P, 4S. Hit the bottom, you go to the next corner. You can see then we come back and do 3D. So we do have 4S before 3D. That is because the 4S orbital does actually have less energy than a 3D orbital. And that's because of how many there are in the orbital itself and how it, and how it will act. Uh, so the 4S does have less. So as long as you follow your energy pyramid, you're going to be good. So 3D. Then we would have 4P, 5S, and so forth. And we just, just keep going, hitting all of our the angles until we hit. And then, of course, when we get to 5S, we just jump over, or 5F, we just jump over and continue down. We could keep adding to it if we had anything be beyond F. Then we would add maybe a G. Let's practice writing some electron configurations, or at least using electron configurations. You'll see both as we go through. So the electron configuration of boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. We want to know how many electrons are present in an atom of boron. And then we're going to write out the orbital notation for boron. So the easy way to figure out how many electrons we have is to look at the superscript or what looks to be a power. So all we need to do is really add all of these up. So if we take 2 plus 2 plus 1, we have 5. So that means we have 5 electrons in boron. Uh, so we want to then write the orbital notation for boron. So we need to fit all of these 5 electrons into the orbital notation. So this is where you want to go back and look at that energy pyramid. 
So we know we have 1s. I guess in this case you don't need your energy pyramid because we have it written for you up here. So this is our electron configura na configuration notation and we are going to change it into orbital notation. So this is just our numbers. So remember this one is the lines and arrows. So we have 1s. We see that there are two electrons so we know that we're going to put two arrows and we're going to put them with opposite spins. Then we have 2s, so a little space, and then we put 2s, and again we have two arrows because it has two as the superscript. And then we have 2p, remember p has three lines, so we're still going to put 2p underneath it, and then we only have one arrow. Do you need to draw, draw all three lines? Yes, you need to show that P has three orbitals uh, and that we only have one electron within those three orbitals. So that would be the orbital notation for boron. Let's try another one. The electron configuration for an element is 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. What is the atomic number of this element? Well, if you remember, in a neutral atom, the atomic number is also the number of electrons. So how do we find the number of electrons? Once again, we're going to look at the superscripts. So 2 plus 2 plus 5 equals 9. So we know our atomic number equals 9. We want to know how many p sublevels are filled and how many are unpaired. Well, we know P has one, two, three lines. So here's our 2P. And we're going to put in five electrons. So when we do this, we're going to remember Hund's rule. We're going to put in one, two, three. So empty bus seat, one in each seat first before we double up. So three, four, five. So now we're going to make sure we have opposite spins. And so to answer our question, how many are filled? We have two filled orbitals. And we have one unpaired electron. This time we're going to actually practice writing it without being given the electron configuration to begin with. So we want to write the electron configuration and draw the orbital notation for the element of sulfur. So what we need to do is we need to look up sulfur. So we're going to look it up and find out its atomic number. And we find out that the atomic number of sulfur equals 16. So that means in a neutral atom of sulfur, we're going to have 16 electrons. So we're going to use our energy pyramid and build an electron configuration. So we know we have 1s, s can hold 2. So now we've used up 2 and we're down to 14 electrons. Back to our energy pyramid go down and we are 2s. S can hold 2. So we're down to 12 electrons. Back up to 2p. Now p has 3 so it can hold up to 6 electrons. So we're going to put in 6 and we're down to 6 electrons. Then we have 3s. So S can hold two electrons, so we're down to four electrons. So then we start at 3P. P can hold six. We only have four, so we just put in our remaining four, and that would be the electron configuration for sulfur. So now it wants us to write the orbital notation. Remember, orbital notation is your lines and arrows. So we would show 1s, and we would put two electrons. Then we have 2s, 
with two electrons. Then we have 2p and it has six electrons. Then we have 3s which has two electrons. And we have 3p, which has four. So one in each first, and then double up for your fourth. And that is the orbital notation for the element of sulfur. Let's do one more. Let's write the complete electron configuration of iron. So the first thing we need to do is look up iron and find its atomic number. So the atomic number of iron, which is Fe, is 26. So now we have to figure out or keep writing until we get or use up 26 electrons. Again, starting at the bottom of the pyramid. So 1s2, you're at 24. 2s2. 22, 2p, which is 6, so we are at 16, 3s2, which brings us down to 14, 3p6, brings us down to 8, 4s2 brings us down to 6 and then 3d. D can hold up to 10 since we only have 6 left we're just going to put in 6. So that would be the complete electron configuration for iron. Mm -hmm.